All right, everyone. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Quentin Ring, and I am the director of Beyond Baroque Literary Arts Center. I am very pleased to welcome you to a reading with Poets of the World Stage Press. We have with us tonight Connie Williams, October Blue, a cold piece of work, Shakira Peterson, and Ravina. I'll say a little bit more about the program in just a moment. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to say a few words about Beyond Baroque. Uh, as many of you know, Beyond Baroque is a literary space in Venice, California, and we are dedicated to the artistic possibilities of language through cultivating new writing, presenting contemporary literature and art, and building a diverse literary community. I'd like to start by acknowledging Beyond Baroque's presence on the traditional, traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielina Tongva peoples. We acknowledge the wrong done to these peoples through settler colonialism, genocidal practices, and the violent dispossession of their land. Beyond Baroque's programming includes readings, writing workshops, and art exhibits. At the moment, our programs are still almost entirely virtual. That's in part due to ongoing concerns about COVID-19 and in part due to the fact our space is undergoing some renovations. I expect we'll be fully open to the public at the end of January, 2022. Um, we do have another upcoming virtual reading next week on Wednesday, November 17th. We're teaming up with Kaya Press to celebrate Trong Tran's new book. Uh, and we'll have uh, with us Maida Vang, Kathy Lin Che, and Kathy Shang to read alongside Trong as part of that. Um, please do check that out. Um, a major component of our mission involves offering workshops to writers of all levels. These include our Wednesday night poetry workshop, which has been running continuously since 1969 and is currently being facilitated by the poet Joseph Rios. Meanwhile, our Monday Night Fiction workshop is being taught by the writer Raquel Baker. Uh, those are, both those workshops are entirely free. Um, additionally, we have an intensive fiction workshop on November 20th with Lori Horowitz, Horowitz. And on December 4th, we have a science fiction workshop with Rika Aoki. Um, Rika, whom many of you may know mostly as a poet, has just published an incredible book of science fiction and so I'm very excited about that workshop. Um, you'll find the link to all of those in the chat. But tonight, we have for you some writers from one of our favorite presses, the World Stage Press. Uh, we're here in particular to celebrate new books from Connie Williams and from Ravina. Um, just, I'm just really thrilled to see this work come out um, and also to have October Blue, a cold piece, and Shakira here as well to celebrate. Uh, the World Stage Press, uh, which was co-founded by Connie, is one of, one of Los Angeles's great presses. I really encourage you to purchase all of our authors' books via the link in the chat. Uh, check out the World, Cha World Stage Press more generally. Um, also, please do get involved with the World Stage itself. Uh, their performances, readings, and workshops have contributed an immense amount to Los Angeles over the years. Um, and the World Stage has long been a partner of Beyond Baroques. Um, the World Stage Press is also affiliated with two other incredibly important literary institutions in Los Angeles, the Community Literature Initiative, the Sims Library of Poetry. Um, and so I'd really say to everyone in the audience, um, you know, please do go check out all of those organizations as soon as possible if you haven't already. Um, I also wanted to say that we'd very much appreciate any donations you can make as part of the evening. You'll find a link in the chat um, or on our website. The past two years have been devastating for many, many arts organizations and Beyond Baroque is no exception. We need all the support we can get in order to reopen. So please do give whatever you can. It will directly support the work we do, the poets we work with, um, and you know, help Los Angeles's oldest literary institution um, to recover from the pandemic. Um, finally, a few words of thanks to our staff, Jimmy Vega and Angeline Keck for their work behind the scenes on this event and Connie Williams and a cold piece um, for putting this program together. Um, so thank you all so much for coming. Um, without further ado, I think we'll just move to the readings. I'd like to introduce our first reader, uh, Ravina Wadwani is a Los Angeles based spoken word poet, educator, and therapist who made her way to the West Coast by way of the East Coast. Ravina was born and raised in the US Virgin Islands and embraces her South Asian roots and multicultural upbringing. Yellow is her first collection of published poetry, congratulations, uh, poetry and prose published by World Stage Press in 2021. Uh, she is a first generation daughter of immigrants and uses writing as a tool for understanding identity, processing trauma, moving through experiences of struggle, empowerment, growth, joy, and healing. She has performed poetry from East Coast to the West as well as overseas. And tonight she is with us here at the virtual Beyond Baroque. Please welcome Ravina. Hi, y'all doing? It's a beautiful thing to be here. I'm very blessed to share space with some amazing, amazing authors tonight. I am Ravina. I am the author of a book titled Yellow. It is a newly 
published collection of poetry and prose through World Stage Press and thought I would be able to just get into it and read some poems for y'all. So this first poem is called Children in Cages. There are children in cages. There are children in cages. There are children in cages. It is 2021 and there are children in cages. There are children in cages and boys behind bars and women holding scars in their skin. Kids in detention instead of meditation, numbers assigned to lives shrunk down to digits, school courtyards that look more like prisons than playgrounds, children in cages and foil blankets for warmth and cement floors for beds. Newborns ripped from their mothers. In honor of red and blue, tell me why all I can see is red and all I can hear is blue. In this country, we are feeding our children competition instead of consciousness. We shove whitewashed curriculums down the throats of brown students, once sitting in chairs that you and I once sat in, makes me think. How much white did I need to wash out of my own system to embrace the brown that seeped through the cracks yearning to be loved? How much talent did we standardize the name of admittances to Ivy League institutions that would rather give us a seat without letting us speak than to feed us what we crave and see us fly. They tell America to celebrate by setting off fireworks of red and blue, run sirens across hoods, shining lights of red and blue, crippling bodies with blood dripping down wounded legs and wars to protect red and blue. America must be hot and cold at the same time. America tells my students to cut themselves into pieces that are digestible enough, tells them they are not enough before telling them they are too much. She cuts locks, bans hijabs, stops the student who is falling asleep in the front row, gives him a number, puts him in detention to become yet another statistic. My children are locked in a system that will tell them how to sit and how to stop spreading their wings when wings were meant to fly. Thank you. And so um, just a little bit of background. Um, Yellow um, is my, my first uh, published collection and it's been so beautiful to just mother this collection and see where it takes me. And so I couldn't do this reading without um, doing a poem about my mom. So my mom is, is a big part of my foundation and really the reason why I'm here, right? So this one is called Soil. And it's for all brown mamas raising their seeds in unfamiliar soil. And it goes like this. My mother was born from the earth. She came out with her hands reaching above the soil, grasping for air survival. And when my mother birthed me, she birthed the revolution that is herself, myself, and the women before us both. My mother's hands are tired. Rolling out rote teas while rocks are thrown at her window, the sound of chaos had become familiar to her. Go home, they yell. And I have the urge to protect my mother with my entire body to remind them that my mother is home and the earth knows it too. My mother taught me that survival often comes before thriving and that our existence here is a paradox and that though this American dream been shot down, blood staining the earth, the same place we come from, brown, earthy, that we are home no matter how infiltrated this soil may be. She sees me and weeps. She realized that it was never about a false narrative with an empty promise built on the backs of women who look just like herself. My mother is a miracle. What I am or what I became was something sprouted from her foundation. My mother was laying down bricks without even knowing it. She built a home within her voice. A safety net in her sense, she fostered a dream in her lap. I do not know what to tell my mother when she tells me she is proud. When she sees what she could have been, had she not been given to the disposal of others, her life laid out to her like a storyline. My mother is sick from the words she has swallowed in this lifetime. My mother was told she was a manufacturer before she was told she was a movement, told she was born to be a mother before she was told she is a universe. And my mother cries for the multiple cells within her that died. And she cries when she sees them rebirthed in me. My mother is a platform. My mother is exhausted. 
She grabs a glass of red wine with one hand and guilt in the other, carves a narrative into my back, etched into my bones is what she could have been and what I can be. My mother tells me I must break free. So when the hollering starts, chewed tobacco spit onto the sidewalk, they say, sweetheart, it is then that I remember of the swords that I carry in my tongue. Of the, I remember I was born with a waist full of knives. Do not touch me, I tell them, pepper spraying them with my voice. And as I hide the truth from her, she finds a way to reel it out of my body like rope. She tells me my truth is stronger and fiercer and louder than any man whose hands I have survived. So I wonder if my mother lives vicariously through the moments I never tell her about. And though I may be broken by all these pieces left on my floor, I must remember that these wounds and cuts and bruises are nothing compared to the first time my mother had to lay down her life before her very own eyes. Thank you. All right. <laughs> and so I wanted to have, um, just depending on time, I have one or two pieces left, so. I thought we could get into it. Yellow was actually um, inspired by um, the ideas of softness and healing and strength and resiliency and really embracing identity and all that comes with it, right? And so um, I wanted to, to read a piece called Flow. And Flow is uh, one of the poems that um, I believe encompasses just the idea of the sunflower. So it goes like this. If we could grow flowers instead of blades from all of the moments we have survived, the garden I would nurture for you would birth more air to breathe. Colorful dainty reminders of all that has not gotten the best of you petals flowing in the wind. Free and able to take you wherever this makes you flow. Soil as fertile with wisdom like the wrinkles in our grandmother's cracked tooth smiles, my goodness. If we could birth gardens and flowers instead of blades become softer instead of steel become water instead of ice. If we could share more instead of holding it in release instead of retreat, look our demons in the face and say, you will not take me today. How we would not be afraid of waves. How we let go of fear as freely as our love goes into the wind. If we could grow simpler not more complicated from all that has tried to get us, how this world would feel more Pisces flow than the sting of a scorpion every time, how we would float. If we found light in the struggle, how we would let it carry us through the elements, how our seeds will be replanted here and there because maybe that is the process. And maybe healing is the win and not the burden, how we can choose to say this right here will not steal me from the rest of this life there is yet to live, how we would strut through fire, how we would see that we are all broken things together, but all we need is a little water and sunlight to help us grow. Do you not see how the moon falls every night and the sun still, still finds a way to wake you in the morning, plants a kiss on your cheek and whispers to you, try again. How we would see that sinking a bit does not mean drowning. It just means that there is more to learn from that which has swept us under like the tide that tried to get you or the tsunami at times. How we would love the ocean whole even if it swallows us deep because somewhere anchored to the ocean floor there is still something sprouting, still growing close to its roots, still deserving of love for all that she has survived even if she is at the bottom. She still has quite the view, doesn't she? Still has a story to paint from the deeper shades of blue, from all that has tried to tear her from her roots, but fails. Thank you. And so uh, I had uh, one more piece to close out with if we, if we have time. <laughs> um, Y'all let me know. You can always, always make me be quiet. <laughs> um, Okay, and this is, uh, this is actually a newer piece. I wanted to give you all a new piece. I took all of the shit you gave me and I threw it into a pile at Goodwill for someone else to find. Once in the store, I tore your hoodie right off of me and snuck it onto a hanger for someone else to find, which is to say, I am probably good at finding you a new home. 
I convinced myself the other side was better, but the other side was a hop over an empty valley. So I filled the empty gaping pit in my stomach with haagen and too many consecutive days of takeout. I purged out the regret that followed it. I listened to what others told me because if I listened to myself, I would be unqualified for my own healing. When I thought of what your body would look like wrapped in new lovers, I turned on the scorching hot water and I scrubbed these thoughts out of my flesh. I turned my own skin red instead of envy green. Thought of this as ritual, I flossed the taste of your flesh out of my teeth. I chewed on hope until I could swallow it. I forced myself to scrape you off of my tongue and spit your remnants out after I gargled your name with Listerine. I tried my best to tear you off of me. I stitched myself a blanket made of obituaries of dead promises. I buried your potential. I gave myself a funeral until I was born again with no memory of you. And I am still here in the same body, still trying to give birth to myself. And I wished my sorrows some closure, bought them a casket. I wrote myself a voice, I laughed. I voiced myself until people heard me, I laughed. I graffitied our truth in every alley of our city. I fluffed your imprint out of our pillow. I crawled into my own gutter of a throat and gathered what was still there. I gave myself back to myself and donated a soul. I reminded myself that you wouldn't take it this time. You, bubblegum love of my life, stuck underneath my cafeteria table, fingernails. You, eyes like sun grazing my skin from a burn from this twin flame. My scars are everywhere, everywhere. Don't you see that scars are stretch marks too? Reminders of how the body keeps the score and how that book became a bestseller because everyone hates a mirror, but everyone loves them too. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Ravina. Everybody, please give a round of applause, virtual round of applause to Ravina. That was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and congrats on the new book. Um, that's fantastic. Um, so up next, we have a cold piece. Uh, cold piece is a father, educator, writer, poet, spoken word artist, and host. He's a graduate of UCLA with a BA in history. Uh, growing up, cold piece stuttered tremendously and was uncomfortable communicating because of it. This caught the attention of his father, who told him to write down what he wanted to say, because when he was reading, his father noticed he did not stutter. At that very moment, uh, cold piece became a writer. He began studying the dictionary and reading every book he could get his hands on. Yet it wasn't until his dad transitioned that he wrote his first poem entitled A 12-Page Suicide Letter in which he dealt with the unexpected passing of his beloved father. Um, since then, a cold piece has, been, has written a wealth of poems, short stories, and haiku. He is also a published author of the recently released book called The Weather Report, a book of haiku and what he calls maiku. He's also become a well-respected host for his ability to weave his friendly demeanor and humor onto his stage time. Uh, I particularly like that last line because uh, a cold beast is like one of the best hosts I've ever seen in this business. And so, you know, I'm, I feel a little awkward up here introducing him when he does it so well for everybody else. So um, please, everybody, welcome a cold piece of work. Um, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a cold limerick, teacher's edition. Some days I don't like my students. I hope my first class is truant. Just let me high five their face with two pair of skates. I bet they'll stop being a nuisance. Thank you. Real quick, real quick. I'm just going to hit you over the head with a bunch of um, short poems. Just so let's get into it. This poem is called The Product of Desegregation. Until the lion have its own historian, the hunter will always be the hero, African proverb. Education in America says your ancestors we're just slave. It is written in the history books. If it wasn't for us, you would still be living in the bush like monkeys. We fed you, gave you jobs. You're so ungrateful. 40 acres and a mule, we feed you, we teach you. Just learn what we are teaching you. We gave you schools, all the ANTs and AMs. We allowed you to be sharecroppers too. We gave you Black History Day, week and now month. What else do you want? Now you can go to school with us, work with us and live in our neighborhoods. We even stop wearing our hoods. We equal, right? Now you can be civil, right? Stacy Dash, Raven Simone, Kanye West, Stephen A. Smith, Charles Barkley, no need to go on. 
you get my point. Like I said, I'm just going to get you a, a whole bunch of short poems. Um, this one is called Blue Lives Matter. Blue Lives Matter. Um, I'm wondering if that includes the Crips. Just saying, our uniforms are blue too. Your shield and my flag are both worn on the left side. We implement the blue wall of silence, the blue code, and the blue shield. Our squad meetings are filled with donuts before we hit the streets. I'm going to be real honest with you. I fear for my life just like they do. The homies do too, but because of this gangster lifestyle, they won't admit it. Nah, not me. I'm a rational crip, and I really don't want to die, especially for the set, but I act like I do. You feel me? We got enemies, though, the Bloods and the police, both them trying to kill us, one legally and the other illegally. I just want to know, when the Bloods do a drive-by, do I, as a Blue Lives Matter comrade, get the bus back on them? Again, I fear for my life. See, as a youngin', I was told they were super predators. They're animals. So I have the right to do whatever is necessary to take them out. I mean, I was born a crib. Moms put me in the blue onesie at birth. Swaddled me in a blue rag. This wasn't a choice occupation. It's my birthright. I'm just policing my neighborhood. Sorry, a cold piece. I think we lost. Uh, I think we lost you there for a sec. Are you back with us? I know. I think. I think they. I think they. I think they shut him down. I think uh, you know there was some like outside interference. <laughs> <that didn't work. laughs> I'm back. Am I back? Can you're you hear back. Me? You're back now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Pick, pick they might up, have yeah. shut me down. They might have shut me down. <laughs> 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 All right, I'm just gonna start back from the um, me, from the middle. Um, I'm just policing my neighborhood. You never hear anyone saying defund the Crips. Community revolution in progress. Between the difference between a cop and a Crip is we actually know we're a gang. Blue lives matter. The real one. Um. Let's see. They're mowing the lawn. Blades left lying in the street. Onlookers appalled. All cops are bad. Guilty to proven innocent. In the sense, this prejudice have been evident since the plantation. Overseer, officer, overseen the overseer, officer, overseen um, masses commodity. This is still police policy. Odyssey with me as I narrate you through the histories of monstrosities. His story told from the hunter's point of view, where they point, shoot, then fork tongue their paperwork while enjoying days off still collecting paper from work. Despite the hurt, my people have persevered and personally veered from the serve and protect. We are tired of your bullet points meeting our young subjects, subjecting our families to grieving. This grievance has become routine as if it's been rehearsed. Then they try to coerce us to believe this blue lives matter. Well, the blue lives have been most of the hashtags and the substances of the black universe. You and I let's converse about these all-star murderers. NYPD stole Eric Gardner's last breath. Tamir Rice wasn't allowed his right to bear arms in the open carry state of confusion. Maitreese Richardson was released on OR, or she's already dead. They tried to blend Sandra's flavor. Freddie's story was broken into a few great areas. Oscar wasn't granted another pass on Bay Area rapid transit. Cops are, trans cops are transitioning our youth into ancestors and all y'all want to do is march. Well, it's November 2021 and the killings haven't stopped. It's two kinds of cops, bad ones and silent ones. Which one are you familiar with? See, this ground ain't fertile. We keep burying seeds knowing they won't grow. A haiku. Um, cops be back of the bus dirty. Watch where you're stepping. So let me give you this one. This one is called Frenemy. I was gonna write a poem about you and how you betrayed me. I mean, initially I was gonna disturb your peace. But since I know who you are, I know you don't have any. I mean, you are in pieces, broke it, haunted by demons or just one, alive and well, well, at least in your mind, mind you that every interaction you have reminds you of your shattered, scattered memories of broken reality really keeps you off balance. 
Balancing passive aggressive behaviors, behaving childish, out cheer being triggered, happy. Your crosshairs target anyone that make you feel unworthy. Your feelings are valid, they're just not true. What I said and what you interpreted was not the same. You will never have a friend like me again, friend of me. And I'm gonna close with this one, um, a Maiku. It's 464. Um, condoms and hearts. Either one of these break, shit just got real. Thank you. Thank you, a cold piece. Condoms and hearts. I love it. That's uh, that's great. Um, thank you so much for the reading. That was fantastic. Um, so uh, up next we have Shakira uh, Shakira uh, Peterson. Uh, is an MFA candidate in creative writing at Louisiana State University, where she served as the editorial assistant of the Southern Review. Her work has been so supported by Clarion West, the Hurston Wright Foundation, and Bona. Her first book of poetry and Polaroids, The Letting of a Little Water, was published in January 2019 by World Stage Press. Born and raised in South Central Los Angeles, she now breathes in Baton Rouge with her cat, Fable, and she is indeed coming to us from Baton Rouge tonight. So please welcome Shakira, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Super, super grateful to be here amongst these beautiful, amazing poets. It makes me wish I was back home. <laughs> I'm going to just get right into it. I'm going to read some poems from my book, The Letting of a Little Water. Um, the first one is called Black Panthers from the Hood. The hood is Wakanda. Our vibranium is hidden in the soil of abandoned lots, the structure of falling buildings, in the walls of liquor stores underneath the four floors. You know those black spots on the concrete? They tell you it's gum. It's not. That's vibranium. Our treasures have been hidden behind force fields of poverty. We just never could afford to cultivate it. We never owned the right tools to grow the vibranium in our own backyards, but we always knew about it. Our parents told us how beautiful it used to be back in the day before the drugs were introduced, before the gangs destroyed the streets, before the police beat us senseless. Unfortunately, the colonizers found out about it. Now, all of a sudden, they feel the need to invade our city, buy our brokenness, gain interest in our emptiness. They open restaurants, put vibranium in the utensils, build stadiums, sprinkle vibranium in the seats, create spaces in our magic city using our own magic while casting every spell in the book to keep us out. Thank you, thank you. Um, this next one I'm going to read is called, um, I Heard Men Pray for Daughters. I heard men pray for daughters. Daddy, did you ask God for me? Mama told me when I was born, you wore pink for a whole week. I wish you wore that color longer than a week. I wish you wore that softness permanently. Maybe it wouldn't be so strange for me to fathom that a strong black man can be soft for me. I once put a lighter to a cotton ball and the smoke smelled like your breath. There's a fire inside of you and out your mouth you spew the flames, covering my sensitivity and slit. And most times the fire isn't directed towards me, but it feels just as hot. I've been contemplating what builds it. Here are my theories. One, the loss of your mother. I think the absence of her beauty is at the base of it too. The mistreatment of society is the wood that keeps the fire burning. Three, your resentment towards my mother. Sometimes I wonder if her presence supplies the oxygen. Experts say you should kill a fire before it starts but you can't fix what you can't see. And I don't know if you've noticed, but some days there are small flames spewing out of me. All daughters ask God about their fathers. Daddy, I pray for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it's really nice to read poems from this book. I published it and kind of like, <laughs> I don't want to say I forgot about it, but you know, I just seemed like so long ago, especially with like COVID. I feel like this was like 10 years ago. <laughs> Um, so it's really nice to revisit. I'm going to do one more and then I'm going to read two um, newer pieces. Uh, this one's called I'm a Loser. I know I am losing the battle when I become the gun. When I lose control of the trigger, 
psychotic stained bullets shattering my sanity. My brain deteriorated by delusion. My mood swinging at anyone in proximity. Irritation chewing at their earlobes. Cynicism spitting in their faces. An armor of positivity scorched by the heat of my hostility. I know I am losing the race when suicide is in the lead. Reality in last place trying to catch up to me. My rational thoughts holding up signs on the sidelines. My legs are broken windmills. I'm trying to win the gold, racing against a timer that flickers faintly with numbers I cannot see. But today, I saw God at the finish line. The fear of losing flew from the cage in my chest. I was reminded that this race, this battle, is not mine to finish. It is not mine to win alone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, this next piece, uh, I wrote it about my grandma. It's titled Corrine. Days before my grandma takes her last breath, my mother and I are in her apartment. I am sitting on her plastic covered couch. My mother is sitting perpendicular to her mother and the seat she always sits in at the head of the dining room table. My mother's seat is reserved by dozens of pill bottles stored in old shoe boxes. The main reason for our frequent visits, my grandma has osteoporosis, a slow onset of Alzheimer's and a medical device attached to her heart to pump its blood. Each diagnosis come with its own array of medication my mother miraculously memorizes. She knows the name, the shape, the color, where the sun should be when it's time for a dose. You take these when you go on to sleep and it's dark out. You take these when you wake up and it's light out. My grandma nods in agreement and watches her daughter draw a sun or a crescent on her pill organizer next to the day of the week. It's Sunday. Stacks of nostalgia tower from the carpet. In the midst of performing her miracle, my mother looks around and asks her mother to explain the disarray. I don't want you to forget that I accomplished things. Remember my awards. My grandma points to a pile and I crawl on my knees to each small mountain. Her certificates from church, her teaching awards, her sobriety chips. I climb through each one, catching small glimpses of a life my grandmother had before she was a grandmother, before she was a mother, a life she did not want forgotten, but in hindsight was not ready to let go of. When a mother is pregnant and labor is near, it is custom for her to begin nesting, cleaning, organizing, and preparing the home for new life. The same occurs when death is near. My grandma was nesting, cleaning, organizing, and preparing to leave this life behind. My mother needs a small check and my grandma knows a guy who will pass her regardless of the gray smoke purging from the car. They ask me if I wanna go. I say no. I stay behind. I weave my way around the valleys of my grandma's life to unspool in her bedroom. In the mirror of her dresser, I fashion myself into her image. I coat my nails with a dark hue of red. I adorn my fingers with her gold. There are enough rings to cover my fingers to the nail and for boxes of more to be left on the dresser. I slide four gold hoops into my ears and three chains around my neck. To complete the persona, I paint my lips burgundy while staring into the mirror. I assume her posture, spine linen, chin raised. I smile, I pose. I am no longer the pubescent version of myself. I age five decades, I become Corrine. Thank you, thank you. And this very, very last piece is so new. Um, I just started writing it about two days ago. <laughs> um, so I'm really excited to share it though. And it's untitled right now. One, I see mama, it's the 90s. It's Maxwell on the stereo, surround sound. One got a short in it, so mama dances close to the one by the window. Her toes red, twirling on the ball points of her feet, her heart beating into the floor, hardwood. We pulled the carpet up ourselves, nails sticking out the ground. She dances anyway, two. I see myself, it's today. It's a final notice from the light company. It's my keys locked in my car for the second time in a row. It's the students I'm supposed to be teaching, the papers I'm supposed to be writing, the ones I'm supposed to be grading. It's the aches in my knee and my neck and my back 
and my shoulder and my brother just got in an accident. The airbags beat his face and I miss all my mama's calls and I haven't talked to my dad in weeks and my toilet been leaking for weeks and they finally replaced my fours and left all the nails sticking out. Three, I wanna dance like my mama. Twirl my body to black summer night stream, but I never learned how to move with spikes beneath my feet, with groans growing in my body and light that only shine when the sun up and windows open. When I wake in the morning and flick the switch when my power be on. If I call my mama, maybe she can teach me perspective, how she overlooked the shorts, how she danced anyway. Maybe she can teach me perseverance over the phone. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yes, thank you, Shakira. That was beautiful. I loved it. Thank you so much. Um, everyone, please give a round of virtual applause for Shakira Peterson. Um, so next up, we have October Blue, who has been writing for over 16 years. She spent many of those years as a self-proclaimed closet poet, but she found her inner strength as a writer after attending various writing workshops that include Still Waters, Still Waters Writers Workshop, and the Anansi Writers Workshop. Since, since then, she has participated in numerous open mics, including Thursday Night Vibes uh, inside of Blessed Vibrations, the Griot Cafe instead, inside of Shades of Africa, and the Speakeasy inside of The Last Bookstore, uh, as well as many other open mics around Los Angeles. She recently placed second in the Size It Up Slam competition and was featured at Still Waters and is a published poet in the book Sounds from the Waters. So please welcome October Blue. Very excited to have you here. Thank you very, very much. And the headline reads, don't call them shark attacks. Scientists want to normalize words like bite, incident, or encounters, wants the public to do the same. Scientists say we need to consider how to the moment a human meets a shark. We need to consider the shark's perspective, consider how intrusive it may feel to be accused of attacking someone who invited themselves into you at dinner, want us to consider how their dwindling numbers say humans need to acknowledge they're the reason that the encounters occur in the first place. Humans barge into a shark's space, all flesh and audacity, asking what the hell is the shark's problem? How dare it act all shark-like? Humans couldn't possibly make a shark nervous unless it was up to no good anyway. And yes, we're still talking about sharks. Scientists say we should go for less sensational language. While they aren't trying to police anyone's language, calling them attack skews the public's opinion. And we all know what prejudice can do. Scientists say sharks are becoming and their existence in the ecosystem matters to the sea. And if we lose them, humanity will follow. Scientists say, although it's hard to accept most encounters society calls aggressive are human provoked, that they get too close, they get too confused, they step on the small ones and because they don't respect the water, swimming in it murky in all black suits, expecting the shark to know the difference between human and an approved meal, that they push their way into their spaces is, to, uh, is for observing and sport, that their acts of privilege are supposed to be respect. They say, how can people talk about sharks, making them sound so dangerous, than they really, more dangerous than they really are? It gives people the wrong impression about a shark's behavior. Scientists say they aren't all soulless predators. They fear if humans don't change the way they see sharks, that the fear of them will make us more willing to support their slaughter. This is still a poem about sharks, about a headline about sharks, not about black bodies or about systematic racism or how you feel about either. This poem is really about sharks, but if all you can racism is racism, postmates. Thank you. Perfection. Perfection will never be attained because eyes can't see themselves. We all found out Santa was a fraud. Lost teeth have no real value, but trying to keep them will break the bank. Little girls will soon realize that they're not the prettiest things in the world. And boys become men who've fallen from imaginary leaps from tall buildings after mama's good towels could no longer help them fly. It's the, the little lies that lay beneath the fragile egos of life's realities and the saddest things that doesn't end in adolescence. Men, they buy into the acting on porn, 
And women really believe there's a Prince Charming coming to save her and all she needs is the right pair of shoes. You got bull on the news like Africans in Liberia have no chance against Ebola. Viruses just appear and test subjects are part of the cure. That plane, it just so happened to have gone missing and now probably houses 244 missing all in the name of religion, the black community. It will be saved by its next leader and leaders of water won't soon be coveted like gold where this plays of wealth he bought in currency of lost soul. You got your worn down souls from peaceful protests and marches because it'll soon make a difference. More lies. There is equality in equilibrium in layman's terms. We will agree to disagree that the lives of black and brown boys are valued and that a mother's tears will ever drive bittersweet instead of salty. And at any point, it's okay for the government to profit off of slavery, no matter what they call it. That started on pyramid. We tried to erase our reason just because they can't duplicate it. Aliens made it. You got teachless teachers, bookless lessons, and it's still defined as education, and we're paying for it. For profit, higher education are the real loans of predators, third grade test scores. Those are used in prison data collection. And they say there's no systematics in the plan, y'all. Them crows are still protecting Jim's land. And they're just as fat and full with all those crumbs from Rockefeller's hands. Wild peaches. Wild peaches grow in Mississippi that locals won't eat because of what they're fertilized with. Trees whose leaves pass down stories of involuntary manslaughter, its roots, guilty by association. Everyone seems oblivious. Another boy shot dead today. Mothers are burying their sons and we still don't know what to call them. There will be a local story. Excuses of badge privileges turn national lose because hashtag blue lives matter too. Reckless rhetoric mistaken for a movement. We shouldn't have to tell them that our lives matter. There's a marked season. We should be used to this by now. Did you know for license hunters, improper kill method can get you fines and jail time. This shooting, these two shootings, the boy who had the candy, who let the other boy hold the toy gun, who told the other boy he'd be okay walking to the store on the day they make they on the day they gave that one man a ride, it will all be overshadowed by the breaking news coverage of the inhumane treatment of a dolphin. Everyone's cameras were working then. No lost footage then. No indictment. There will be outrage, internal disruptions, posts, shares, comments, live feeds leading to lifeless ideas. Did you know for hunters, the law says it's illegal to leave your kill in the streets, but not in the trees. Strange fruit runs through these roots. Eulogies whispered amongst the leaves, revenge must live in its shade. No more taglines because there's blood at our feet, passed down in their privilege, lineage at risk of extinction. Did you know for license hunters, the law says, Changes in predatory prey ratio, the prey must be protected because it's an endangered species. And I'm just thinking, maybe we can get together and decide to work with PETA because they can get laws passed to cover their interests. Um, regarding pink beanies. When there isn't enough religion or justice in the courtrooms, manhood in the nation, if it should require lynching to protect a woman's position and delicacies from raving, thousand times a week is necessary. I would rather see a thousand die before a Negro goes to the polls before a white woman, Rebecca Felton, the founding member of the feminist suffrage movement. I'm regarding your pink kitty beanies. They don't quite match my RBG. We ain't never wore the same weary. You mad? You mad I won't force wear on the soles of my shoes for your tiled robe that it's clear. Your privilege is showing. You expect me to brace body against your picket fences? Well, not today. I won't be marching in protest of your perceived mistreatment or breaking glass ceilings in your glass house. We ain't never been sisters in suffrage. We nursed your babies, washed your floors, served your meals and your men at Seneca Falls, stood in the back of your lines during your marches. Your wins have never increased our stats. 
bettered our communities, equal, not even on the table, separate always in order. You push naming rights and equal pay, strengthening your position in supremacy while we fight to be treated as human, to be educated for the lives of our children, our men, our resistance is in our existence. And you, you turned a blind eye to the poisoning of our children, our wounds and water, not allowed to whistle, walk on sidewalks, drink water when thirsty. Where were your pastel prints during forced sterilization or in the aftermath of Tuskegee? We are still birthing affected babies. Our wounds will never grieve the same. We weren't accepted in the now, back then. We ain't never shared the same pain. Alice, womanism is to feminism as purple is to lavender. So you not seeing the color won't ever clear the picture. Besides, your pink kitty hat gets lint in my hair. Me and my folks, we must fight together because our struggles can't be gender specific. We need each other on them front lines because I am reminded every day that I am a black woman in that order. Thank you so much for letting me share. This is amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you, October Blue. That was incredible. Um, just so, so powerful. Um, so um, I just want to remind everybody in the audience to please support our author's work. You can purchase uh, their books through the links that have been provided in the chat. Um, please do show your love for, for their writing and for their readings tonight by going and buying their books. Um, our last reader for the evening is Connie D. Williams. Connie is a poet, actor, community activist, and performance artist with three collections of poetry. Uh, his newest book, The Distance of Observation, which is just out, as well as Leaves of, a Spil Leaves of Spilled Spirit from an Untamed Poet and Blue Red, uh, Blue's Red Soul Falsetto. In 2015, he released two critically acclaimed CDs of his poetry accompanied by music titled River and Moon and Unsettled Water. He is the former artistic director of the World Stage and coordinator for the Anansi Writers Workshop. He's also the co-founder of the World Stage Press. His poems has, have also been published in various anthologies and journals, including Dryland Review, Voices from Lemert, uh, Cultural Weekly, Jumping Between Us, Askew Poetry Journal, uh, Wide Awake Anthology, published by Beyond Baroque, and Poets and Allies Anthology. He has performed his poetry on television, radio, universities, and colleges, uh, and various venues across the United States. Uh, all which is to say that Connie is just like an incredible force uh, in poetry. Um, and in Los Angeles, and he's just uh, he's just a great, great poet and a great reader. I wish the only thing I wish we could have tonight is to see him uh, read live instead <laughs> of virtually. This was originally scheduled to be a live reading a long a few months ago before we switched everything. But I'm so glad to welcome Connie to this virtual space. So please welcome Connie Williams. Thank you, thank you, Quentin, and uh, big ups to uh, all the readers. Man, it's been a uh, like a forest fire, <laughs> Ravina, Cold Peace, Shakira, and October. Uh, big ups to those uh, wonderful, wonderful writers and readers who represent the World Stage Press and themselves in uh, such a remarkable way. And I hope that uh, we all can continue to be optimistic and present. Optimistic and present. <clears throat> the women of Los Angeles must be taking classes, unmasked, training at a secret location. They are taking injections of Botox, laced with a desensitizing agent. Their makeup is a facade used to infiltrate the new age men. They are upsetting the balance of world power recalibrating patriarchal structure that has given peace of mind to men for centuries. When did Rose refers? My intuition says it coincided with the shift in global warming. The synchronicity of their vocabulary belies any randomness. The cogency of my tautology has an error factor of minus zero. When did women begin saying, it's not your fault? It's mine. 
and I'm not looking for a commitment. And yes, I promise I will call you. These phrases and others like them have the, been the domain and exit strategy for me and since I can remember. Is there a resistance movement? Are there underground LA women who are buying Beyonce's latest CD laced with subliminal lyrics? I will date and marry a guy who is not traditionally handsome and makes less money than I. But these women of Los Angeles must be training at a secret location to reverse roles of relationship. Tell me why there are so many of us men getting dumped this close to Christmas. There's a feminine chill cruising throughout the Los Angeles ether. Malls are packed with sensitive men who are carrying their own bags, doing daily guilt shopping, indiscriminately buying things they don't need. They're eating in groups of five or more at places like the Olive Garden. These women are upsetting the balance of world power, recalibrating patriarchal structure. They devour more than they nurture. They have become impermeable with ceramic hearts and latex skins. They need distance to hear themselves. But today, today, I am ready to admit that I hurt like an eight-year-old who's never received a Christmas gift, or even though I know that there is no real conspiracy, the silent tremor in my head and this numbness certainly makes it feel as though there is. Every date isn't a kiss and all relationships aren't marriage and it sucks that cold fronts coincides with breakups. Then she calls me out of the blue and for no other reason than she really does care about me just to share a laugh because that's what former lovers do. I tell her that I am writing again and realize that the living room sofa is no place to sleep with memories. We make promises to catch up soon. And it's been a month since it ended. Two months, two weeks since we talked and she's no longer in my life and nights seem to fit better. And even though I know that there is no real conspiracy, I will continue to walk around as Agent Mulder believing that there are alien women living and dating in Los Angeles. Thank you. <laughs> this next poem is called Walking to Love in a Garden Near Babylon. Had I expected all this, I would be a younger man, full of hard muscle, wise like resistance. My vocabulary would be laden with back talk. Had I expected you, I would be more confident. You would see the hazel of my daughter's eyes in mine. All of you is more than this rigid bone and reluctance. Unimagined song you are so much more woman than Adam or I expected. Thank you. It's so wonderful to be here tonight with uh, these wonderful readers inside and uh, also with Beyond Baroque as a partner of the World Stage Press. We certainly appreciate this opportunity. This is what poetry looks like with your eyes open. Family is a place I'm hostage. No ransom request except for blood congealed round scars, birthplace for opal irises that predict future molesters. These are God's handprint. Strong across my brow slaps hell out of mother's firstborn joy, cradled in Medea's ashy arms on communion Sunday, fresh, sweet, Potato pie, coos, stove top. I'm written back room of 4821 Long Street while Mystic's funky Broadway 
Discovery sits edge of a box spring masquerading. Sleeps, comes after dreams awaken. Life orbits scripted lovers and domesticated violence. My pen commits suicide. Chronicled in frayed dungarees and bare feet, my body is a canvas of trust, a receptacle of straps and switches. The victim is always clueless. Mother's infidelity or daddy's loathing morphed into haikus and sonnets. I have memorized my sleep. These eyes have seen worlds beyond the chicory darkness. Only a sixth child could be acquainted. This is a poem I wrote for my, uh, uh, my youngest son, Noah. It's uh, called What I Smelled on You Last Night. It must have been the same perfume, Mary Magdalene waterfalled on Messiah's head before his betrayal by Judas, a fragrance so pregnant with melody that it permeated that room with envy and adoration simultaneously. I smelled it on you, my son, as I lay behind you on that yawning sofa, every, even though every window was open in that cozy Vienna apartment, two person European cars shimmy by like lawnmowers, cafes lark late with conversations I can't comprehend, as though these ancient architecture, their ghosts straddling their ornate balconies, were writing offers about you visiting her, pulling me in tow. They must be inhaling you too. The aroma on your skin, stalking street corners and pedestrian riverbeds. This apartment can't contain it. No more than that room where Christ reclined and that former whore found redemption that night in her extravagant offering. How she must have earned the money to buy such confection and grace. So much delicateness poured out as though there was no need for tomorrow. And I feel like that tonight. Your adolescent musk preparing me for the day when tomorrow will no longer be necessary. I must close out with one final poem. I want to once again thank Beyond Baroque for having us here tonight. Really appreciate that. Big ups to the other readers who read tonight. And make sure I find the right. <clears throat> Thoughts on the sidewalk at LAX. Inside the refuge of his muscle, sentimental doesn't become her. But this new love, this earnest ache, pliable, present, persistent as light in darkness, persistent as a struggle inside her bone, has made her consider, surrender, absolute, made her confess to her mother. She no longer desires to live as a wolf howling in her sleep. She wishes his brownness next to her at 3 a.m., holding his thickness when despair of the familiar pulls her hair like an angry love. This new love is too genuine, too whole to wear every day in front of friends and the world, too uncomfortable to taste as sweet as dried banana. She's desperate to wash it out of her skin, out of her ambition, but lavender airport lights and a longing more solid than concrete sidewalks made for temporary goodbyes has made her realize she does not have the want inside of her hands to undress the safe of this love. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you, Connie. Um, <laughs> I am never, I never cease to be blown away by your readings. And that was fantastic. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you also to Ravina, to A Cold Piece, to Shakira, um, and to October Blue as well. Just really, really killer reading um, from everybody. I really appreciate you all being here. Um, yes, yes. Um, so if everyone just wants to, you know, say a last goodbye and just thank you to our audience for being here. Like I said, get all the readers books. Um, we all appreciate it if you'd support them uh, directly. Um, and thanks everyone for being here. Have a good night. Thank you so much, Bye. Quentin. Thank you to the other writers, all of you. Thanks, Connie. Wonderful, thanks, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. <laughs>